Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, welcome to the second module of Globalization and Culture. In contrast to the first module, which was very heavy in concepts and ideas, where we try to deconstruct globalization in its different aspects, beginning with the uh, communicational, we went on to the technological, the uh, political, and we concluded with the economic aspect of glo globalization. But we also found that it's not possible to uh, isolate, isolate these aspects of globalization from one another because they are inextricably intertwined with one another. Particularly when we talk about culture, uh, we find that each the cultural aspects of globalization are a fallout or a, or a, a co-effects of globalization on culture and usually culture is what becomes the site for resistance to globalization. Now, in this, uh, from this module onwards, we would be looking at, we would be focusing on the, on the cultural aspect of this course on how globalization impacts culture. Uh, and, um, uh, we would be moving on not only to the conceptual um, ramifications of uh, the impact of globalization, but also look at particular case studies as to how cultures have been impacted by globalization. Uh, I uh, would be focusing in this first unit on global cultures and I would uh, place my emphasis on the globalization of South Asian cultures. The questions I would like to pose in this uh, unit is to ask if there is a global culture, what is this global culture? And if there is a global culture, what is this global culture? And how is it related to local cultures? So to brush your memories, we we go back to the apprehensions of purists and guardians of local culture who expressed uh, deep apprehensions about alien cultural invasion with the onset of globalization, which they, uh, they feared would lead to the erosion of local cultures and identities. However, three decades later, we find that the global media scape or global cultures cape is quite different from what the doomsday sayers had predicted. In order to understand how the global cultural landscape has been uh, altered or how the local cultural landscape has been altered with globalization, we need to, we need to understand the terms global and local clearly. So far, we have been focusing on the global. And I hope that in the last five uh, units, I have been able to uh, deconstruct the definition, the notion of globalization effectively. Uh, what we haven't engaged with is, what is the local? Because local is always seen as an opposition to the global and invariably equated with the national. So, if we look at global as a translocal movement, the, it's contrasted with vernacular spaces or vernacular movements, which uh, are defined as limited to a particular space, a spe spe spatial geography, which are invariably seen uh, in, as nation states uh, with the state centric division of space having become normalized during the era, era of modernity. So today, when we talk about the local, uh, we tend to confuse the local with 
the space of the nation, the culture of the nation and we tend to see how globalization is leading to the erosion of national cultures and identities and when we speak about resistance again, we try to oppose the supposedly what we believe to be a global culture, a global monoculture with a particular national culture. But as we found out in the, in the section on globalization and nation, the nation state has not just uh, uh, become uh, less powerful, but it has also become, has been con reconfigured re uh, with the onset of globalization through the rising power of the region on one hand and through the clout of transnational formations on the other. So, with that, can the nation still function as an efficient or uh, powerful, uh, powerful mode of the local through which the global can be compared or the global can be resisted? Or has globalization also led to the transformation of the local? There are alternative ways of defining the local. The most common way would be to look at the local as the national in terms of the nation state, there, but there are several other ways of looking at localities. Uh, uh, we, as we, when we talking about micro, micro nationalist movements, we found that the emerging power of the region has led to the also the emergence of regional cultures globally. So, the local can alternatively be defined in terms of the region and finally, we can even talk about the local in terms of very small, very specific neighborhoods, very small places. So, with that, let us begin, uh, let us look at whether globalization in other aspects has also had an impact on culture and whether it has also led to the homogenization of culture. So, let us begin with asking Tomlinson's question again, when he asked does interdependence and connectivity lead to a single global culture. And uh, if, we rem if we recall, Arjun Rai had pointed out the disjunctures between diff movements of different things, between people, ideas, cultures. So, that automatically leads us to the, in, to the deduction that interdependence and connectivity in other space spheres does not really lead to globalization in other spheres. Yes, the connectivity and proximity which is the effect of globalization has certainly led to a transformation of locality. Let us look at how the localities have been transformed through globalization. Now, first of all, we need to demystify the myth of the so called global monoculture, which was supposedly believed to have invaded local cultures and led to the erosion of local cultures and identities. And this, this global monoculture for monoculture for some reason was equated with American culture, particularly American popular culture and it, it was supposed to have uh, led to the signal, uh, led to the extinction of all local cultures and identities. Now, this question uh, has been examined by several theorists of globalization and, uh, uh, and they concur that uh, global monoculture as, uh, as it is feared is a myth. The reason being that there is first of all, there is no single monoculture. It depends on which part of the world we inhabit, we are, Im we are impacted by a, that particular global monoculture. So, the idea of equating global monoculture with American culture is a fallacy because for people in other parts of the world, for instance, even uh, such as Southeast Asia, Japan may be that monoculture or in South Asia, Indian culture might function in the same way as American culture in the in the entire world. So, there if, if there are if there is a global monoculture, there is no single global monoculture 
but there are several global monocultures. Perhaps the American global monoculture, which is American, is probably has a larger reach than the other cultures. But as we slowly find out that these other global monocultures have been competing with the suppose the so called global American culture in terms of its reach over the last few decades. So, if we and also how do we conceive this global monoculture? How do we define this global monoculture? So, um, Anthony Smith explores this question. He tries to answer this question. Is there a global monoculture? If there is a global monoculture, how do we define this global monoculture? Is it to be perceived along the lines of a national culture as it is commonly done? Let's say when we equate global monoculture with American culture, is it really possible to equate the, uh, the global monoculture if there is one with American popular culture or American or a particular national culture? Is it a national culture? Is it the culture of a particular nation? Uh, Tomlinson said that uh, there is no particular niche national culture which is being imposed on another nation as it is imagined in the cultural Im imperialism theory that certain nations, certain dominant nations are trying to impose their cultures on other nations. But in the era of globalization with the nation state itself coming under a cloud, is it possible to talk about a global monoculture in terms of a national culture and which is in turn invading other national uh, nations and eroding other national cultures. So, Smith says that it is not possible to have a global monoculture in terms of the uh, of a national culture for three reasons. One, he says that to be a culture, a national cu culture needs th three things. One is that it must have a common memory, it must have a sense of historical uh, specificity and three, it must have a sense of continuity. Now, the global monoculture that we see today, uh, if there is one, is memory less, essentially memory less. It lacks an historical specificity, does not have a sense of continuity, memory or sense of common destiny. And the process of cultural transfer is far more complex than it is believed to be. What has really happened is that cultural experience has been lifted out of its anchoring in localities and moved on as has been deterritorialized. It is time to revisit Arjunapadurai's model of the scapes and Manuel Castell's idea of the space of flows in order to understand how culture flows in the era of globalization and whether these cultural cultural flows in turn produce a global culture. So, uh, Arjuna Padurai borrowed the notion of flows from Castell's uh, metaphor of the space of flows and he spoke about uh, the flows of images, people, goods, ideas and money which he defined as mediascapes, ethnoscapes, uh, financecapes, idioscapes, technoscapes and he also called attention to the disjuncture between the five scapes. Now, uh, when we conceive of flows of globalization, it is commonly believed that global cultural flows emanate from the global north and flow to the global south, which we may call the myth of unidirectional flows flows are believed to be unidirectional, flowing from the global north, from the more developed nations of the west such as your UK, US, Canada, Germany, France and so on and um, to the global south, parts of South Asia, Southeast Asia and so on. But this myth of unidirectional flows is disrupted by the reality of flows which are bidirectional. 
So, as I said earlier that the same media and technologies which led to the flows of culture from the global north to the global south have also been used to disseminate local cultures and I local cultures worldwide by, by some resourceful producers. Merely the possibility of uh, disseminating has encouraged cultural producers and enthusiasts from disseminating, uh, sharing these uh, cultures in small groups initially, which, uh, which were uh, and the mobilization of which led to thicker flows from the global south to the global north and leading to bidirectional flows, which uh, Daya Tushu a leading theorist of media cause contra flows or reverse flows. Now, uh, so the flows are not, but I would like to modify this by saying that flows are not just uh, unidirectional or bidirectional. I would say using the analogy of the computers, of the computer which Castells himself used to say that flows in the global era are multidirectional because they flow from all parts of the world to all parts of the world, even though there are certain hubs at which from which they are redirected to different parts of the world. So, some, some spaces, uh, some areas might serve as hubs in the same way as in a computer, there are different nodes from which uh, flows, uh, from which information circulates, it is uh, brought to a hub and then redirected to different parts in a similar fashion. Uh, flows of culture uh, from different parts of the world flow to other parts of the world directly or sometimes they are redirected by these hubs. Now, when I say that the, uh, when I talk about the reality of uh, uh, reverse, contra or multidirectional flows, I am not denying the inequality of flows. The proportion of flows from the global north to the global south far exceeds the proportion of flows from the global south to the global north. Uh, which has a lot to do with the dominant position of the nations from which they flow and the, their control of media and technologies. So, while it is technologically, technically possible for peop for, peop uh, for uh, weaker nations or smaller nations or nations or uh, groups in the global south or weaker groups within the global north to circulate their cultures globally, they are constrained by other aspects such as economic or political power, even though they may possess the technological capacities to disseminate their cultures. So, one cannot deny the ubiquity of American popular culture and of, but there is also the happy, uh, the, the other side the, the silver lining is that even though American popular culture is ubiquitous, there are also other cultural flows. And the second aspect which we will later investigate is that American culture, what we think is American culture itself is composed of cultures of its, because there is no such, uh, America is essentially a cu culture of migrants and what we understand to be American culture is a culture produced by uh, to which migrants to America have contributed in a significant manner. Now, oh, I go on to movement of South Asian cultural flows to the global north. As I said, the technologies of circulation, the new media, the markets, the move, the four, uh, four ways through which South Asian cultures have circulated not only in the global north, but also in different parts of the world for due to four aspects. 
One is through the technologies of circulation. The second is through media. The third is directed by markets. And finally, to the movements of people. So, now let us begin by defining South Asian culture. I would be focusing on Indian culture, but uh, since we have been questioning the efficacy of using the rubric of the nation to talk about the cultures of the present, which invariably cross national boundaries, I am using the term South Asian cultures, uh, which is again a very limited term to talk about cultures originating on the Indian subcontinent, which have traveled across the world. And uh, sometimes these cultural flows have been, have been, have crossed national boundaries. They have, be, they have flowed across linguistic, ethnic, religious lines. So, it is no longer possible to talk about in a uh, in terms of a monolithic Indian culture uh, circulating in the global village. So, when we talk about South Asian culture, it is heterogeneous in terms of class, nation, gender, sect, language, ethnicity and so on. But at the same time, we find uh, also several instances of border crossings. For instance, the Hindus in Nepal, in, in India and in Nepal would have more in common with one another than the Hindus and Muslims in India in certain aspects. Similarly, the linguistic uh, sharing between the common language between Bengalis in India and Hindu Bengalis in India and Bangladesh Muslims, Bengali speaking Muslims would, would create a particular cultural matrix uh, which crosses the national rubric. Similarly, in India and Pakistan, Punjabis in India and Punjabis in Pakistan would have much more in common as would Tamils in India and Tamils in Sri Lanka. The next aspect that I would like to uh, bring to your attention is that we have been talking about interna international hegemonies. We have largely been talking about the global with respect to a local uh, in relation to the superpower America, the sole superpower America in the present context. But we have not really looked at international, uh, inter-regional hegemonies. For instance, the position of India versus the rest of South Asia. It is common be commonly believed that Indian culture works in the same hegemonic fashion as American culture functions in the rest of the world with respect to other South Asian nations. So, but since we have been looking at the limit, limited limitations of the nation in understanding the cultures of the present, we also look, need to look at intranational hegemonies. The intranational hegemonies in terms of the hegemony of the certain uh, center versus the region in terms of the hegemony of the classical cultures vis-a-vis -vis folk cultures of high cultures and low cultures, popular vis-a-vis -vis cla uh, classical vis-a-vis -vis popular cultures, male cultures and female cultures, cultures of the elite and the cultures of the masses. So, these hegemonies are intrinsically uh, signaled indicated through the polarization of high and low classical and folk, uh, elite and non-elite center and region with one, uh, one pair in the binary enjoying an inordinate power, com dominance and power compared to the other. So, when we look at the particular case of India, we find that uh, in the production of an Indian national culture after the independence of India or a few years preceding the independence of India, uh, sometime in the 1930s produced a range of inter intranational hegemonies with the nationalist reformers, cultural guardians and producers borrowing the categories of the West to 
to classify Indian cultures which did not quite fit into these categories. And the myth of uh, a, a pan-Indian culture uh, which was uh, um, uh, predicated on, on the Hindu epics Ramayana and Mahabharat, the great tradition of the Ramayana and Mahabharat connecting different parts of India, the classical uh, Sanskrit culture and uh, the folk cultures of India which were regional, which emerged from uh, uh, different parts of India as a form of interdependency and it was the unity in diversity ret rhetoric posited that these folk cultures, these folk regional cultures uh, in different Indian languages were tri tributaries of the great Indian, largely the great Indian Sanskritic culture. Uh, now, I would like to show how these intranational hegemonies uh, within Indian cultures have been deconstructed, have been demystified through the, through globalization, through the voice that regional to the small local traditions, some of them regional traditions in different Indian languages, some of them non elite traditions, some of them fo uh, folk, which are some of which are folk traditions, some including popular cultures, have uh, f uh, found a voice in the new space of globalization and how this has upset the intranational hegemonies. So, the idea that classical and folk was were interdependent, interdependent and there was a great tradition, little traditions and a popular culture, again the division between Sanskritic cultures and Dravidian cultures uh, was uh, the binary was used to elevate certain cultures such as the classical, such, such, such as the central culture over the folk popular and regional cultures and uh, divided into two streams, the Sanskritic and the Dravidian uh, in the production of a national culture and certain cultures were marginalized uh, such as the other great tradition, namely the Persia Arabic tradition in the construction of uh, national Indian national tradition in the 1930s. So, we had a division of first of all we there was an elevation of classical which was uh, in which was articulated to the spiritual and this production of a classical Indian tradition along the lines of classical western tradition led to the uh, uh, led to the construction of an Indian uh, classical tradition which was sanitized of uh, its central elements as opposed to traditional Indian cultures which, which displayed a healthy mix of the sensual and the sacred and sensual and the spiritual through the construction of a spiritualized classical tradition, classical music, classical dance and so on. And uh, the other important change was that the producers of uh, these cultures uh, were stigmatized. Uh, the producers such as the Tavayevs in the north or the Devadasis in the south and the non-elite instrumentalists who accompanied the, the, the courtly and temple cultures were also stigmatized and their place was taken by middle class performers. Now, this uh, hegemony of classical cultures, this dominance of Indian classical cultures seems to have been de destabilized with the emergence of new cultures in the era of globalization. Uh, and uh, I will quickly, um, quickly conclude with the movements of Indian cultures to the global north, South Asian cultures to the no glo global north beginning with the hippies movement in the 60s when uh, the interest, uh, western interest in eastern mysticism uh, led to a particularly uh, the Beatles interest in eastern mysticism in transcendental meditation and, and Mahesh Yogi brought them into contact with Ravi Shankar and 
got them interested in Indian classical music and dance and Ravi Shankar and Sitar and we all know that was history, this meeting between Beatles and Ravi Shankar. So, the first Indian culture which uh, the first culture which circulated, the first reverse flows from South Asia to India was that of classical music, courtesy the hippie movement in the West, courtesy the Beatles, where um, music, uh, dance, now these cultures, but, 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 but uh, the Beatles exoticization of Indian classical music and um, ended up in equating, in producing a particular narrative of Indian culture, which was that of a mystical spiritual uh, culture of gurus and uh, sages. And that was the kind of myth about Indian culture, which circulated in the West with the popularization of Indian classical music during the hippies movement and by the Beatles in particular. But today, this also led to the travel of yoga, uh, to the West. But today, when we talk about globalization, we find that uh, there is a dispersal to different parts of the world and that leads to the transformation in content, theme, style, address through cultural contact and what has happened as a result is that the global has become part of the local. And what, are, what are the reasons for the dispersal of uh, local cultures globally? The first reason is diasporic. The first reason in the particular case of South Asia was diasporic nostalgia and the need among the second and third generation diaspora youth for identity, which led and uh, thirdly, it was the appropriation by the capitalist music and film industry to cater to uh, the demand for South Asian music in the West and finally, new satellite technologies and media. Now, I will uh, be looking at various uh, cultures of, various cultures of India which have flown, uh, which have flowed with the onset of glo globalization, including dance, music, cinema, uh, fashions, food, religion, spirituality, lifestyles and so on. But uh, this uh, section I will in end by, uh, by uh, saying that the first Indian culture which uh, was globalized after the 60s hippie movement after Ravi Shankar Sitar was a little known culture from North India, a uh, harvest ritual of Punjab called Bhangra, a dance which was hybridized in UK and transformed in a new music called Bhangra, which completely transformed the image of Indians in the eyes of the West by making it, by making, by, by making Indians seem not spiritual as Ravi Shankar, Shankar and Sitar did, but transforming them into cool. Thank you.